HPV. We have a, a lot of data, sometimes contradictory and confusing, but we're starting to, to get a clear view of this picture. The, we have uh, several papers relating an elevated pH with a high risk of HPV infection and also with a higher risk of an abnormal pap test. And what most investigators have done, they have concluded that it was probably due to bacterial vaginosis. Uh, however, bacterial vaginosis, indeed, it has a lot of papers which also relate directly with cervical dysplasia and cancer, but we cannot assume that an elevated pH is always due to bacterial vaginosis. And for that, we must account for an entity which is the aerobic vaginitis. Aerobic vaginitis was first described in 2002 by Professor Donders, who was sitting there. It, however, it is still not a widely recognized condition. It, in the former studies, it probably was uh, several times mistaken or misclassified, misclassified as bacterial vaginosis. We know these days that it might be, a, or it is associated with LCL pap tests, with uh, definitely with an increased risk of STIs, including HIV, and with severe obstetrical complications, such as premature rupture of membranes, preterm labor, and coronavirus. The diagnosis, as we've heard this morning, can be easily done by a four-year-old kid using a microscope, and for that you must look at the lactose array rate, the number of leukocytes, the proportion of toxic leukocytes, the background flora, and the proportion of parabasal cells. Using these algorithms or these schemes, you end up with, uh, with an AD score. If it is equal or higher than five, then you have uh, clinically relevant disease or moderate or se and severe AB, which is what we'll be discussing next. Uh, we evaluated consecutive women which had an indication for a PAP test. Uh, exclusion criteria included or were um, women who were younger than 21 year old were pregnant who had a total hysterectomy with vaginal bleeding or with uh, the use of vag vaginal medication in the previous 48 hours. And in all women, we collected a, a sample of vaginal discharge into a slide. We allowed it to, to dry, and it was uh, later read blindly using uh, uh, face contrast microscopy wet mount. All women also had a pep test and Roche called as HPV. We enrolled 959 women, uh, most of them 86.8% came from us, our cervical pathology unit, which probably was an advantage we could, as it allowed us to have a, a lot of uh, normal pap tests and the HPV, high risk HPV positive tests. The mean age of the women in the sample was 41.4 years old. Uh, we consider as a major pap smear abnormality anything that was worse than LCL. And in this series, we have 30.5% of major pap smear abnormalities. As for high risk uh, HPV, we had 46.1 women with a positive test. This, uh, this graph shows the distribution according to age of BV and AV. The prevalence of BV was about the double of that of AV at 15.5% for BV and for AV 7.4%. Then we looked at uh, in these women what happened, what is the chance of women who have AV comparing, to compare, we compared women with AV and without AV. We looked at the, the chance of having an abnormal pap smear, of having a major pap smear abnormality, or of having an HPV positive test. The only statistical significant difference we found in women with AV was a higher likelihood of having a, a major a pap smear abnormality, 22.5% in women with AV versus 12.7% in women without AV. Then we performed the same exercise for women with AV and we couldn't find any statistically significant difference. As I've said at the beginning in several studies, probably AV was considered as BV or misclassified as BV. So we performed the, the exercise of putting the two things together like an AV for a group to And interesting, inter interestingly is what we find. We also found a statistically significant difference for in the group of major pap smear abnormalities, which means that if we misclassify BV, AV as BV, we still can get the correlations for BV, which indeed cannot be real. If you look at this data in another way, we get that women with the AV get 76% higher risk of having a major pap smear abnormality. Traditionally, in the literature, BV has been associated with cervical disease. However, in our study, we couldn't find any association with pap test abnormalities or with HPV infection. 
uh, if we look uh, a bit uh, deeper into the literature, we can find that in women who have uh, CIM, uh, the interleukin profile is very similar to that uh, that is found in women who have, who have, who have AV and not uh, it's much more similar to the, to the ones who have BV rather than to the ones who have BV. So probably there's a role here for chronic inflammation which, which came with a lot of attention in the last years and probably AV and the, its inflammation play a role in this history. Um, however, as I've said previously, if AV is misclassified as BV, we still can find the associations and it can explain some con contradictory results that have been found in the past. Or we can look at what is common between AV and BV. In both, there is an absence of lactobacillus. So, is it uh, the, the absence of lactobacillus the main question? Uh, we don't think so. We've published on that previously, and we could find an, uh, an association with inflammation, but not with absence of lactobacillus. So, lactobacillus definitely, definitely play a role, but probably not the main role in this question. Our conclusions, AV but not BV is associated with major prep smear abnormalities and in this study we had a 76% increase in risk. However, if we misclassify AV as BV, we still can find some correlations. Neither BV or BV were associated with HPV infection and I think one of the most important lessons that we must take from all this is that we must use, our, must use a microscope in our daily practice in gynecology. Thank you.